Gary Wotherspoon, thank you for talking to me. Your book Gay Sydney A History is a fascinating read. Uh, it's a sequel with an updated version of your book A City of the Plain. Why did you feel it was necessary to update it? Uh, when it was first written, it was published in 1991, um, I'd done a lot of the research on the old uh, history of uh, gay life in Sydney and we were in the midst of the AIDS crisis so it was really a very depressing time and it was also a very academic book. It had an introduction and conclusions, the introduction had to explain methodology, verification of sources and all that. But in the past 25 years the world's moved on. So the new book doesn't have an introduction, doesn't have conclusions. I've been able to integrate in a lot of the other research that's been done by other people in the past 25 years and I brought it up to date simply because gay issues these days hit the headlines all the time. Same-sex marriage, I mean homophobia in sport, all these sort of things are very relevant in a city gay politics. So it's time to bring it up to date. The first book was published in 1991 and you just published of course your new book. How much harder was it to do the research this time around considering we've got the internet and everything? Well, it was much easier. I mean, part of the, uh, even even some of the academic work that's been done in various studies, uh, cultural studies and that, much of that is now even available on the net. Um, and Google, I just Google the title and it'll give me a range of sources. I can go there, read them. And if you look at the uh, footnotes of the book or the end notes of the book, much of it now is simply www.something. It's very detailed. You briefly cover the time from the First Fleet and you talk a bit about the sodomy laws and a few people I think were executed, they received the death penalty. Do we have any figures for that? Uh, yes, you can go to that. There's a guy, uh, uh, Peter Deval, who's done a thing called, uh, I'm not sure if it's actually a title, it'll come to me, and he's gone back through all the records. So he's got very detailed records of court cases, police reports, things like that, yeah. Now most of the book covers the 20th century and the beginning of obviously the 21st century and you've got some wonderful characters. You've got a Madame Helen Pura, you've got Black Ada, you also talk about the former governor of New South Wales who preferred the company of men. How did you decide who to include in the book? Well, I chose what I call colourful people. I mean, you, there's so much minutiae that you could have just sunk in that. So what you really got to do is what's the narrative and what helps explain the narrative. And uh, the reason it starts, I mean, I, I cover a bit of the 19th century, but the reason it starts roughly where it does is in the 1920s in Australia and in many Western countries, there was a big debate about sexuality. Was sexuality a private matter or was it really a public matter? So uh, but partly the late 19th century worry about uh, what people did for sexuality was the, the decline of the white race. And so by the 1920s and 30s, it was much more about psychology, individual pleasure, things like that. Many more women, uh, Marjorie Piddington, got involved in this because it's women's bodies who ultimately bear society's views on what they can do with them. The book has a serious side, but it also has some comical aspects. You talk about one of the grand balls and they used to have a band mainly made up of ex-military personnel who were blind, so they couldn't see people of the same sex dancing. Did you have a lot of fun with this book? Look, it was wonderful. I mean, when you come across something like that, you know, the uh, newspapers in the 1940s and 50s were always trying to do exposés about the nice boys and the effeminate men and things like that. And so they try and bribe people to tell them what was happening. I mean, hiring a, ba a band of blind people was one wonderful way the band got employed. And I mean, if you're an ex-service man, blind, there's not a lot of occupations you can do. <laughs> but the gays certainly helped. Another wonderful story was the uh, truth, one of the yellow rags of Sydney tried to, uh, thought they had an expose of a gay party occurring in a hall, I think it was uh, Mordale or somewhere, and they had cameras and that, and they rushed in through open the doors, and it was just a local women's group me having a meeting. <laughs> Now, throughout the book, I notice there are patterns. There are times when Sydney seems to be more liberal, and other times it seems to be more repressed. I think in the Second World War, we had all the GIs here, and people were experimenting. And then post-war, there was a certain form of repression, almost McCarthyism with the Cold War. Why do you think we had these waves? Um, well, certainly, 
It, it's partly to do with world affairs. I mean, the reason the repression set in after the war was people felt that there had been too much liberal life. Um, there was VD, there was sleeping with the Americans, male and female were sleeping with the Americans. And so there was a feeling we had to revert to and, and what was a mythical past, actually. Australia has never had this perfect, you know, nuclear family, you know, husband, wife, two children living in the suburbs life. And that was a myth. But the Cold War brought uh, a great deal of anxiety about what the future would hold. McCarthyism in America, but even in Britain, the same thing, weeding out homosexuals initially in government, but then in anywhere. And the same happened here. There were even cases where, and certainly in the going back a long way, but predominantly in the 50s, the police used agent provocateur, handsome young cops who'd go into a toilet, pull their dick out, wave it around. And if you smiled or looked at it, or even if you didn't, they might well arrest you. Your book makes it clear that Sydney wasn't isolated. It had outside influences. There was like the Kinsey reports, the Wolfenden report. There was the book written by the psychiatrist DJ West on homosexuality. How much outside influence do you think these reports and investigations had on Sydney itself? They were very important simply because there was nothing like that being done here in Australia. So Britain, the West, uh, DJ West's book on homosexuality, the Kinsey report. The Kinsey report was amazingly interesting and revelatory. I mean, that a third of all white males past a certain age had at least had one sexual encounter with a person of the same sex to the point of orgasm. And that, people didn't take it up at the time, but it certainly, in the long run, it meant you, you can't have two thirds of the population jailing one third. And of course, these had effects on the legal and medical attitudes, didn't yes, they? Yes, yes. The, I, mean, I mean, the psychiatrists were very slow to take up Freud. Freud had already said in the 30s, you know, homosexuality is just one variation of the human sexuality, so it's not a big issue. It never really permeated out into the public until Gay Lib came along. And then the Kinsey report giving statistical evidence was also very important. The other thing that they were, that was interesting, Kinsey said there is no such thing as a homosexual, there are homosexual acts. So he was rejecting the idea of a, an identity. And yet, late 19th century, they had created this, uh, Cardbeni had created this idea that there is a homosexual, who everything about this person's life relates to their sexuality. And even though Kinsey had said, well, no, by the 70s, a new identity, gay, had emerged and actually became a very strong political weapon. Another influence which surprised me was the car. You talk about how the car gave people more freedom. What effect did that have? Well, prior to, um, I mean, the car came after the war and uh, because higher purchase came in, so young people getting their job, 17 and 18, could, could start to buy a car on higher purchase. And it gave them freedom to get away from their peer group and their families and all the old, you know, localised controls. And certainly many young gay men from the suburbs were able to come into the beats in the city, the pubs in the city and things like that. So uh, one of those very strange uh, serendipities, you know, you can get a car and suddenly your life blossoms. Oxford Street's obviously been a gay hub for men. One of the things we often hear is about the lockout laws, which is blamed for many businesses on Oxford Street failing and clubs and bars closing down. But you say complaints about Oxford Street have been happening since the 1980s. So obviously lockout laws, in your view, aren't the only reason. What, what other reasons are there? Uh, lockout re uh, laws have minimal effect, minimal effect. I mean, there's two things. One, the decline of Oxford Street in terms of shops and things, it's a, a victim of its own success. I mean, all these wonderful little boutiques, interesting shops and things like that. Suddenly, people, the owners, could bang up the rent. But at a certain point, the rent goes up too far and you really can't afford to run your shop. You've got to, you've got to make $2,000 a week simply to cover your rent and your living expenses and things like that. The other thing then that impacted on it is the Westfield Malls, Bondi Junction Mall and the one in the city. Suddenly, people can drive to Bondi Junction or come straight into the city and all the shops that they want to buy things at are in the one building. You don't have to go to, you know, 20 boutiques along Oxford Street in Paddington. You just go into Westfield in, uh, in the Pitt Street Mall and it's all there. So it's rents, um, the Westfields, but also some of the complaints are, oh, it's going to lead to the destruction of the live music industry. Well, 
Live music's been going on in the suburbs forever. It isn't only Oxford Street. Many of the people who complain have a great deal of self-interest at heart. Do you think also the fact that people now get on apps such as Grindr, also people, a lot of gay people who identify as gay anyway, go to non-specific gay bars, they feel more comfortable. But one thing you do talk about is there'll always be a need for a safe space. Yes, I mean, we're, we're different to other communities in that if you're an ethnic community or a cultural community, you're born into that community. So you know your identity right from the word go. Uh, in terms of dissident sexualities, you probably only learn when you're a teen or something like that. So you're and basically you grow up in an environment which isn't of your own sexuality. So there always has to be some place where people who don't feel at ease at home can come and think, this is my territory. One thing you also mentioned is, despite a lot of bars closing and clubs, the community or sub-communities are in many ways flourishing, such as the bear community, and people are coming together. They, they don't need a one just set location. I mean, you've got uh, the internet now, which allows you to uh, meet up with people, arrange a whole range of things. So it's a non-contiguous community. It doesn't have to only be located in one small place. And you also talk about the prejudice within our own community, particularly racism towards Asians, towards Arabs. How bad do you think that's become? Has it become worse or are we just reflective of society at large? I think we're just reflective of society at large. I mean, it's a, Islamophobia is just on rampant now. And I think that does reflect across into the gay and the lesbian communities. And yet there was a thing called Club Iraq which is organised by, a, a, I think, an Arab lesbian woman. And it's one of the most wonderful parties you can ever go to. And it's packed with people, it's packed. So, all right, yes, there is racism and uh, homophobia within those communities, but things surface. You also say, are we becoming just like them? What do you mean by that? I sometimes used to go to one of the local delis, smart delis up in Crown Street, and you had to push your way through couples. Two men, two women, children and their dogs. It was just like you were suddenly in suburbia. You'd sit at a coffee table near them and you'd hear them talking about the school soccer match, when they had to go to a PNC meeting. Hey, would you get the kids immunised? So in that way, gay life has become very much suburbanised or like the majority of Australians. Hopefully not all of us will go down that path because I think there is always a role for the outsider in society. Someone who can look at society and say, well, no, this isn't how it should be. You also talk about how almost professional and organised current protests are, like with marriage equality. You know that back in the 70s, 80s, 60s, people would dress quite scruffily, they, they, they came as they please, but now people look very professional, shaven, they've got professional placards done. Is this a good thing? It's a sign of the times. I mean, protest, there's no point in, you know, having long-haired hippies walking through the streets now. The big change came in the 60s where most protests were dismissed as long-haired radical rat bags and hippies and things like that. But in the 70s, once Nobel Prize winners like Patrick White started a protest about things. You could, you could say it took on a different dimension, protest took on a different dimension, and now it's all very professional, of course, and why not? And of course, very briefly, uh, Mardi Gras, what influence did that have? Look, um, Mardi Gras was more a symbolic moment rather than the star for Australia. Camp was set up in 1970. Um, we'd, we'd had national homosexual conferences, we'd had demos all through. 1978 triggered uh, a wider awareness and partly because simply how bad the police were. I mean, within a year, they had repealed the Summary Offences Act, which the uh, Council of Civil Liberties had been complaining about for decades. It gave the police excessive powers and no control over the, well, their authority. And then they had uh, a year later, I think, uh, Offences in Public Places the Act was passed to replace the summary offences, which has greater controls on what the police could do. So Mardi Gras today is a pale imitation of what it once was. What were the biggest challenges in writing the book? Um, getting up at 6.30 every morning for months and months and months and sticking with it. But by the time 
I'd, I'd done the revised version, it was actually quite interesting. I mean, you, you, you become involved, it becomes part of your life. It's your child, you've got to get up and look after it and make sure it's happy and fed and keep going, keep on keeping on. Was there anything that surprised you when writing the book that you didn't expect to discover? Look, some of the, uh, the, the things that people got up to in the 1930s and that, I mean, Black Aiders, Dance Academy, where, you know, she'd sit there and, you know, and as soon as the vice squad arrived, she'd scream out, with the couple on the right, keep in step, one, two, one, two, one, two. And I mean, all this to fool the police. The police weren't fooled, but they went through the motions. Things like Madame Pura's um, very elegant uh, uh, Latin, uh, Latin cafe, uh, which got written up in various novels and things like that. And it was a much more respectable thing, but in the washroom or the toilet, many assignations were made. Nothing might occur there, but you might find love and lust just there. Gary, thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>